So it's you first and Caroline. Friends, thank you for coming back. Uh, we have two panels this afternoon, the first of them entitled Private Domestic Law Analogies and Solutions. Before turning to that, though, <clears throat> we're going to give an opportunity for panelists uh, of yesteryear uh, to respond to questions. Tom, do you want to? He asked if uh, the proposal that Tom Ginsburg and I laid out, namely that the IFIs would extend insurance uh, against future uh, 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 non-payment of, of sovereign debt to the successor regimes might not have a moral hazard problem. And I think, Bob, the answer is no. Uh, it, it, uh, First of all, to get that insurance, we envision that the, the uh, successor regime has to make, make a successful presentation to the IFM, IFI, to some tribunal, that their debt or some portion thereof was, in fact, owed to this. Uh, on the other hand, it's possible that uh, the availability of that insurance will induce people to make excessive number of claims for protection. Uh, uh, there will be an excessive amount of repudiation. And I, the analogy I think to myself that I, I want to explore some more is whether there might be some <coughs> penalty imposed on successor regimes that ask for this relief and don't get it. Uh, it's like a, an NFL coach who asks, who throws the challenge flag. And if the challenge is not granted, they lose a timeout. Uh, I think that your point is well taken, and we need to think that through. I was worried about after the Yes. Therefore, I will become more odious myself. I, I will build the palace because uh, that's the moral ha that's part of the moral hazard problem. Right there. Once you get it, it, it takes away the, some of the incentives for it to necessarily service the debt. Tom and Carolyn. Uh, yes, there we are. Uh, here's how I how I thought it would work. Um, I would have it be like a payment default with immediate acceleration, which you're absolutely right would be unusual because you would think it would be more like a technical default and thereby subject to waiver. And that's simply because I'm more concerned about limiting the access to credit to fund an odious regime. And so I'm willing to take those additional costs, including obviously the collapse of the entire structure. Great. <clears throat> Shall we move on then to our third panel, <clears throat> Private Domestic Law Analogies and Solutions. We have a very distinguished panel. Let's, I'll move down from my left, Bob Thompson. Uh, next to him is Debbie DeMott, um, uh, Adam Fe Feibelman. Next to him is Melissa Jacoby and uh, Chantal uh, Thompson. And all the way in the back is Bob Rasmussen. I would propose we move first with uh, Bob Thompson. Let me say just two things by way of introduction to the subject matter of this panel. <clears throat> In the end, we are talking about debts that are evidenced by legal agreements, legal instruments. And, at least in the pri for private sector debts, roughly 90% of those legal agreements for cross-border lending are going to be governed by the laws of England or the laws of New York. That's a fact. Hmm? So w when we talk about odious debts and what solutions there might be to odious debt, it seems at least fair to say, uh, what does the domestic law that has been chosen to govern those debts have to say about the subject? Um, we'll start with Bob uh, on this <coughs> theme that <coughs> the debts that are being incurred by sovereigns are being incurred by legal fictions. A sovereign is a legal fiction as much as a corporation is a legal fiction. Mm -hmm. And is it uh, 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 valuable to analyze how that legal fiction is uh, uh, incurring the obligation, by whom is it incurring it, uh, what has its agent done, and can we look at domestic law uh, 
uh, uh, analogies in the area of agency and piercing the corporate veil that might be helpful. I'll let Bob explain all that. When I contemplate my reason for being here today, what came to mind was one of President Kennedy's most famous quips, which occurred on the return of us from the state visit to France, where the First Lady had wowed French society and culture, uh, in which President Kennedy said, as he got back to the White House, I am the man who accompanied Jackie Kennedy to Paris. In this situation, I am the guy who accompanied Lee and Me Too on a, on a wonderful adventure ride through Odia Step, through an article that we have done. My role is as a, as a private law guy, different than part of what we did this morning, and, and I want to suggest from that perspective how private law can contribute to the discussion. And I want you to, to uh, to, I want to change your image from where Professor Trujillo started us this morning. I want a different image. I want you to imagine on the board behind me a, a, a triangle. And I want you to see a triangle. Just, just take, let me show you. Just take, take this half of this thing. There's a triangle. This point, third party creditor. This point, the principal. This point, the agent. Lines between them. This is about that three way relationship. This is about what the legal rules should be in that three-way relationship. I do it through agency, showing the three-way relationship, through piercing the veil, and through odious debt. Parallel three points. Each case, the left-hand top point is the third-party creditor. The right-hand point in agency is the principal. The bottom right point is the agent. Uh, the relationship, there's a debt between the top two parties. There is an <laughs> obligation running from the principal to the third party. Who is going to pay it? Move that to piercing the veil. Similar pattern. Pattern, there is now third party creditor, the upper left, upper right is the corporation, uh, bottom right uh, is the shareholder. The, the obligations between the corporation and third party creditor. Move to odious debt, same triangle. Upper left, third party creditor, upper right, country, bottom right, the government officials. The question is, who should have the, the, the risk of non-payment, of non-performance? The usual rule in agency is that the principal, upper right, is responsible for the debts, for the, for the actions of the agent. Usual situation, principal has to, has to stand behind the agent. Principal has to pay up when the agent acts. In corporate law, Usual situation, the corporation pay, has to pay for the debts made, made by it. You can't pierce the veil to get to the shareholder. Odious debt, uh, principles of, of succession, the country has to continue to pay for the debt, uh, and you can't avoid it. What, what we try to develop in this paper, which I want to expand upon here, is given that usual rule in each of the three situations, there have and long have been exceptions in which the law says we're going to shift the risk of non-performance away from where we start. In agency, we sometimes shift the risk of non-performance away from the, from the principal and to the third party. Now, how does this happen? We say the agent lacks authority. When the agent lacks authority, the principal doesn't have to pay. Now, what usually happens is the agent has no money. So the result is the third party ends up carrying the risk of non-payment. This happens at agency regular, regularly. One example, uh, going both ways, there, there's a classic case uh, in agency, Dean Witter versus Blackburn. A widow makes a deal with a nefarious agent. Uh, the agent takes the money and is gone. The widow wants Dean Witter to pay. The question is whether or not the, the widow has to investigate investigate and see whether the agent was really lacking authority, and the court ends up siding with the widow. Contrary example, uh, Anaconda, a case we talk about, uh, there is, an, again, a runaway agent. The runaway agent, there's some sense of collusion with the third-party creditor, and, and the suggestion the court makes in that situation is the third-party creditor now has the risk of, of investigating. Similarly, in piercing the veil, normal rule is corporations liable, you can't pierce, but when the shareholder, the bottom right actor, when the shareholder has done something untoward, the courts regularly in this country, it happens over and over again, the most, it's the most litigated issue in corporate law. 40% of, of litigated cases on this issue, courts pierce the veil. They change from the usual rule because of the conduct of the shareholder. What, what, uh, what, what I'd like to suggest is that this helps us understand when the court could move from the usual rule of state succession, 
of saying the country must be liable and say that in this situation we are going to shift the risk to the third party creditor in the same way that we do it in agency law and in piercing the veil. Now once you accept the possibility of that premise, the question becomes, okay, what are the reasons for doing it? Uh, they were probably going to parallel Pearson the Veil agency as well. If there's been some nefarious conduct, if there's been some wrongful shifting of risk, if, if there's been lack of consent of the party, if, if there's some question about it, uh, there, there are parallels there as well. And so my basic point is that private law can be very helpful in deciding the core question, which is the same core question of these three parties, when should the risk of non-performance be on the third party and not the country, corporation, or principal? Thank you, Bob. Uh, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, my paper, which is a fairly short one, originated in a series of conversations with Me Too. Uh, and he, of course, bears no responsibility whatsoever uh, for what might uh, follow. Um, the central point I, I'd make, I guess, is this. Um, I think that although agency law doctrine um, can be helpful in thinking about this problem, however it might be defined, and possible resolutions, um, it's only as a basis for analogy, and sometimes fairly loose analogy, rather than a body of doctrine that works very well uh, if thought to be directly, um, directly applicable. Um, it's first helpful, I think, and perhaps you know this is known to all of you and very anodyne, but within the law, uh, within the common law systems and the civilian systems, uh, the point of agency doctrine um, is that it's focused on representation. Uh, that is to say, situations in which one person, um, the principal, uh, is represented by another person, the agent, uh, such that the agent's actions have legally salient consequences for the principal. Um, it's actually interesting to me as a scholar of the common law of agency that the words agency and the word agent mean so much, di they mean very different things in different academic disciplines. Uh, I thought at points in actually looking at some of the papers for this conference that people use agent or agency sometimes in ways that I think are different. Uh, from the legal, um, the legal usage. Um, my paper develops, uh, to make the more specific points I want to make, the, my paper develops a series of comparisons uh, between sovereign uh, borrowing uh, incurred by the fictional state of Ruritania, which is the example in um, the paper of Lee and his co-authors, uh, and a um, private business corporation, Zenda, which is associated in, with Ruritania in a novel named, uh, entitled The Prisoner of Zenda. Um, and to get further traction on some of these contrasts, then I use these, uh, these two examples. And I, I, won't, I won't belabor you with the examples uh, this afternoon, though. Uh, the central uh, dilemmas I see, or the central obstacles I see to using agency doctrine as more than a basis for fairly loose analogy in this circumstance are um, these. I mean, there would be more, but I'll, I'll mention these. Um, agency is premised on the relationship between the agent and the principal being consensual. Uh, in the prototypical odious debt scenario, though, that does not seem to be the case. Uh, this is a difficulty. Uh, lots of the uh, legal consequences, I think, of agency can be justified by the consensual character of the relationship. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's a, there's a very central uh, dilemma or problem. Um, secondly, I think that identifying the principle is a problem. Uh, in the, the, the tradition of writing about the odious debt doctrine, if there is such a doctrine uh, that originates with SAC, but that continues on in more recent writing, uh, the principle is often identified as the people, the people of Ruritania, uh, as, to, uh, as opposed to the state itself, which is, of course, the obligor of the debt. Uh, this is curious. I mean, we wouldn't say that it's the shareholders of Zenda, Inc., that are the principal, 
uh, for purposes of the consequence of, of debt incurred by Zenda's, uh, Zenda's management of the day. And we might wonder, well, which people? I mean, this is not a continuous group of uh, individuals over time, uh, and a bit more troubling than intertemporal shifts in the definition of this rather fluid principle. Some, some of the um, uh, people benefited from the regime. Some of them were complicit with the regime. Uh, some of them then, to go back for purposes of the common law of agency, could be said really to have consented or after the fact, perhaps, of unauthorized conduct to have ratified it, uh, which is another significant chunk of, of basic agency doctrine. Uh, so that I would view as an obstacle. Um, agency also, and this goes a little bit to what Bob said, uh, has very robust doctrines of ratification and apparent authority. Um, both ascribe significant consequences that bind the principal to actions taken by the principal uh, either to assent to what the agent did if the agent initially lacked authority or to indicate to a third party that an agent has authority. Uh, my my, my, my pos uh, view is that these are robust doctrines within uh, com the common law of agency precisely to guard against the risk of opportunistic conduct by the principals at the expense of third parties. Um, it would otherwise, I think, be attractive to principals to wait till after the fact, to see whether the transaction appears to be uh, uh, beneficial or not to the principal, and then say, oh, but my agent did not have authority to bind me. Um, which I think agency would enable a principal to do because, of course, the full circumstances of the relationship between the principal and the agent are not transparent to third parties. They're private to the relationship between principal and agent. Those very robust doctrines, particularly of apparent authority. Um, the final point I'll just share with you, again, is one that, that, that Me Too urged me uh, to... Um, make perhaps a bit more emphatically than the, than the paper itself does. Agency doctrine in any of these systems, I mean, the co any of the common law systems or any of the very civilian systems, has a yes or no on or off quality to it. The principal either is bound by what the agent did or the principal's not bound. The agent's knowledge is either imputed to the principal or it's not. This is not a world of proportionality. Uh, I know that you know there, there, there is a concept uh, and a practice in some political settings of proportional representation, but proportionality is aesthetically, I would say, incompatible with the, with the doctrines and the concepts of representation for legal purposes. Uh, there is, in other words, a kind of starkness to the common law of agency as it applies um, and uh, that, again, to me is an additional and perhaps even larger uh, feature that it has that I think makes it problematic uh, as a source of much uh, uh, practical traction with regard to odious death. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Debbie. Um, Adam, would you like to? Sure. Uh, first, I want to thank Me Too and everyone at Long Contemporary Problems for inviting me to participate uh, today. Uh, and second, I'd like to take a quick moment to mention, um, some of you may know that there's going to be a symposium on the topic of odious debt uh, in February over at UNC, which I think may be a kind of follow-up to this uh, conference in many respects. Um, and uh, I think some of the folks who are here will be there. Lee will be there and Sean Hagen. Uh, who's general counsel of the IMF will, will be there as well. So those of you who are either who either live here or have very generous travel budgets um, uh, may may be interested in that. And you can find information, I believe, on the UNC Law School website. Um, so I, I won't try to summarize uh, the paper that I've submitted to the volume, uh, but I do want to emphasize just a few uh, kind of quick and general points about it. And the the argument that that I make in the paper is that the doctrine of uh, equitable, equitable subordination um, is uh, potentially a very useful uh, 
tool in addressing uh, the problem of odious debt. Uh, and uh, this is a point that actually a number of people in the, mor in the morning panels have made, which is uh, encouraging uh, to me. Um, and I kind of initially pursued the, the topic in reaction uh, or in following up uh, Robert and Lee's and Me Too's paper uh, that Robert just discussed and Deborah just critiqued, um, uh, in which they, they, they suggest kind of at the broadest level that basic common law concepts uh, from private law, from our domestic legal systems, uh, can provide uh, readily accessible, uh, effective mechanisms uh, that parties can kind of use to effectively repudiate or discharge sovereign debt without um, significant legal or institutional uh, innovations. And I think uh, that equitable subordination as a tool is appealing for uh, a couple of very general reasons. One is that uh, in many respects, I think it may be kind of a better fit uh, for the problem um, for some of the reasons that, that uh, Deborah was uh, mentioning um, with respect to agency as, as, the, as kind of an alternative. Um, and admittedly, it would require um, some uh, uh, kind of doctrinal translation to use equitable subordination in, in this respect. Um, uh, but I think it may require less um, uh, to do so. Uh, the first hurdle in, in actually kind of thinking about how equitable subordination might be used or useful is that it's Kind of generally thought of as just a bankruptcy doctrine, right? Something that exists within bankruptcy only, um, which wouldn't be of any use in the sovereign debt context, um, uh, given that there isn't a, a bankruptcy system available for sovereigns or uh, sovereign debt. Um, but in fact, it turns out that at least in some jurisdictions, uh, and I haven't been able to figure out if New York is is one of those, um, uh, courts are actually willing to employ the doctrine outside of the, of, of the bankruptcy uh, context, um, which makes sense because uh, if you kind of go back and look into the genesis of the doctrine, um, uh, it, it was actually derived from very general equitable principles um, and uh, that these basic principles have been presumably incorporated into uh, the common law in, in most states. Uh, so to apply the doctrine in the context of uh, sovereign debt um, would require kind of referring back to the pre-bankruptcy uh, 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 state of the doctrine uh, and or to general principles uh, of equity jurisdiction that may still be kind of extant in the common law. Um, and to kind of oversimplify it, the principles, I think, uh, as articulated in the, in the doctrine as we have it, uh, provide that an obligation uh, can be subordinated or uh, avoided, uh, effectively at least, if it was the product of inequitable behavior that caused harm uh, to other claimants of a common debtor. Um, and I think if you kind of apply this doctrine in the context of sovereign debt, this could capture a significant percent, percentage or portion of what we think of uh, or describing as odious debt, or at least the most odious of, uh, of odious debt. Um, and uh, an important reason why it would satisfy uh, the, the definition is uh, because I think you can make the case that extending odious debt is, in fact, harmful to other creditors, which is a point that Kunibert made in the morning, uh, which I think is an important one, right, that uh, if you're a bona fide creditor, uh, of a sovereign, then your interests are harmed, at least to some extent, by that sovereign incurring odious debt, um, which of course assumes that a sovereign may incur both odious and non-odious debt, which I assume is a controversial uh, statement. Um, uh, and, but this is because, uh, you know, bona fide creditors presumably have an interest uh, um, uh, in not competing for common assets with uh, debts that didn't provide any uh, value to the debtor. Um, and, uh, and at the point of any potential restructuring uh, would be uh, competing with those creditors for, uh, for common assets. Um, the, the more 
kind of intriguing and appealing thing about the doctrine, at least to me, is uh, uh, a, a slightly different point, and that is that it would, could and would likely, I think, be available to creditors to employ against other creditors, um, which would basically kind of put the tool for kind of policing odious debt uh, in the hands of uh, legitimate or bona fide uh, creditors. Um, uh, and assuming that they have the incentive to do so, um, uh, to pursue a claim for equitable subordination, uh, then, uh, then I think that they would be in a good position to do so, given the leverage that they may have and the skills that they uh, presumably have in monitoring uh, and, uh, uh, and acting on information that they uh, gather. Um, and uh, again, uh, as other, many other people have said, based on conversations that I've had with Me Too, um, I'm somewhat optimistic that, uh, that this is something that creditors could conceivably be interested in doing. And there are examples um, that are kind of trickling out of creditors um, uh, uh, actually taking uh, kind of action in, uh, in pursuing other creditors to their common debtor. There's the Kensington Paribas case. Um, you could arguably understand uh, the Norway action uh, as an attempt to prod uh, other, uh, other creditors um, uh, in ways that might at first seem contrary to their own uh, interests. Um, though I just wanted to very quickly um, respond to a couple of uh, uh, points that were raised this morning. Um, one was the idea that Anna mentioned, I think, in a question about what about uh, assignees? Uh, of, uh, of, of, of debts, um, which is not exclusive to, to this uh, proposal. Um, and I think that uh, one thing that many of us have to think about is whether there could be any transferee liability, which is not a settled question, I don't think, um, uh, uh, and, and, and something that I think is at least on the table as, as potential. Um, and the other point that I wanted to make is a number of people have pointed out uh, the fact that the introduction of a odious debt doctrine would presumably increase the cost of borrowing, right? Given the uh, increased uh, risk of uh, of uh, repudiation to the creditors, which I, I I think is obviously true, but I, I do think that you have to factor in the possibility that if the mechanism is effective, then presumably the amount of odious debt that's extended in the first place would be reduced, which could have at least a positive or re reducing effect on the cost of credit. I'm not suggesting that that would net out as a positive reduction in the overall cost of credit, but I do think that there's at least some uh, potential benefit to weigh against the cost. Thank you, Adam. Uh, let me interject one thing. Some of you may have formed the opinion based on the panels this morning and this afternoon that we all work for Me Too. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is wholly correct. That is wholly correct. <laughs> A few of us openly acknowledge that servitude. Uh, there are others in the room uh, who have bridled at the yoke, but eventually they all come to heel, I promise you. So, uh, so uh, understand uh, that in context. Let, let me jump over Chantal and, and turn to Melissa. Well, thanks very much for including me. I'm another who must profess to come from studying domestic bankruptcy and commercial law. And I'm here in part uh, to use a parallel from this morning about undebt. I am an un-co-author uh, with, with Adam. And we have a friendly disagreement on some of these private law issues. Uh, and I just want to briefly tee up some, some issues since uh, without a paper, I've lost some of my claim uh, to taking up even more time here. Um, so let me say that I do have some skepticism about using private law concepts here, even though I do see some some benefits, at least from some of the, do uh, some of the doctrines. Uh, I see that equitable subordination and perhaps some others, maybe unconscionability and the like, at least have an expressive function that captures some of the moral concerns that some have been worried about um, that may be absent from some of the other private law doctrines that do not, do not really channel, channel those concerns. Um, also, private law doctrines, because there's such a, a range of them in commercial and insolvency law as well as in corporate law, really are directed at misbehavior of a variety of different kinds of parties. So some might be better directed toward despotic 
borrow borrowing while others against irresponsible lending. And it seems from the discussions today that there are all of these different kinds of concerns. They don't always completely overlap. Uh, with those, some of those benefits in mind, uh, here are some of the concerns that I have. Uh, one is how well many of these doctrines even work in the domestic context. And here I'm talking more on the insolvency side than, than on the corporate side. Uh, doctrines like equitable subordination, fraudulent transfer, uh, deepening insolvency, these are pretty controversial in the domestic context. Now, it might be that they'll work much better in a sovereign context. Uh, maybe that they would try find their true expression there, but I'm, 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 I'm not sure about that at this time. Um, uh, second, they really do change fundamentally by moving them into a political context. As I worked through, at least briefly, the equitable subordination arguments, I found that by the end of how I was trying to apply it, it was neither equitable nor subordinating if we moved it into sovereign debt. Um, and so I think that is something to, to be concerned about. Maybe a better result comes at the end, but maybe not. Um, and then ultimately, um, many of the private law concepts, I think, are really geared not toward the ex post effect, but toward the ex ante effect of harnessing the power of creditors to, to monitor, um, to reduce the extension of odious debt in the first place. Um, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic toward that view, but I think we do have some problems and complications when moving that into the sovereign context. Um, the first, which is raised by Anna's uh, distinction of what kind of creditors we even have here, are that they do have different monitoring capacities. These are very different kinds of institutions from a sociological or anthropological view. Um, and so they're set up differently. They're doing business differently. Um, now, I don't think that that means that some are issuing debt and some aren't. We might quibble a little bit on that point. But I don't think we can, we can view this as a monolithic monitoring kind of question. And then the second piece of that is, I think it's pretty controversial, even in the domestic context, but even more, it seems, in the sovereign context, what level of monitoring is desirable or feasible. Um, the line between monitoring and meddling uh, could be a little fuzzy for many people. Um, the line between complicity and complacency, I think, also is. Um, so I, I don't hear, um, and I'm, I'm a newcomer to many of these issues, most of these issues in the sovereign context, I hear far from a consensus as to what level of, uh, of involvement is desired in these situations um, when, when we have such delicate political considerations and cross-cultural considerations. Uh, so that's sort of the basis of my skepticism. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Chantal. Thank you. Um, and thanks to me too um, and all the organizers uh, for inviting me it's really been very interesting, and I'm very happy to be here, not to offer a paper, but just to share some thoughts from my perspective as someone who writes in international trade and development on this issue. Um, and um, I would maybe start out by saying that, sort of in response to what uh, what what your your remarks, that there's that there is a sort of controversy around the use of private law and international law um, that goes a long way back in the emergence of, uh, of customary international law in particular, but that is a formal matter of international law doctrine that general principles of private law are, are accepted doctrinally as a source of international law. So that in, in that sense, it's uh, entirely legitimate to refer to, uh, to principles of private law not only strategically or for matters of persuasion, but actually formally and doctrinally as a basis for creating an international law argument, uh, potentially to reduce debt burdens. So um, now, this is customary international law. It's not binding treaty law. So it's binding as a rule of customary international law. And so in that sense, there's always a question of how successful attempts are to build customary international law doctrines. But even if you can't enforce through a treaty body a, a, an emergent rule of customary international law, you have access to sort of a more diffuse soft law network of global policy pressures. And I think it, it's in that vein that I see this whole series of interventions and attempt to really change the um, the surrounding dialogue and maybe contribute to the development of an emergent um, doctrine of customary international law. So with that, I just in the, a couple of minutes, I'll, I guess, try to talk about some of the cognates of the concept of lender liability in private law and how, in particular, international trade policy might be relevant to 
the analysis. So a lot of the uh, analogy from private law has focused on the issue of lender liability, and I um, wanted to talk about, in addition to the doctrine of equitable subordination and agency and piercing the veil, um, an interesting series of cases that has uh, uh, arisen in the last couple of decades um, in contract and tort um, on the general issue of lender liability um, through a variety of causes of action uh, arising both as a countersuit claim against banks and foreclosure proceedings and sometimes as the basis for original uh, complaints for damages based on duress, um, fraud, or interference with business relations. So the sort of general doctrine of lender liability has arisen out of a bunch of different instances, but the overall uh, the overall rule is that where a lender sort of overly meddles in uh, the activities of a business and the business suffers harm, that there is some damage award or reduction of the business's liability that can flow as a result. So the sort of foundational case uh, was a Texas state court case, um, State National Bank against Farah Manufacturing Company, 1984, that dealt specifically with the issue of a lender's undue control, and there the issue was that the chief executive officer of the business had been ousted, um, and when he tried to uh, re, uh, sort of tried to, tried to fight for uh, resuming control of the board of directors, essentially the bank blocked that process, and the company suffered a, a decline in its fortunes as a, as a result. Um, and uh, subsequently, uh, the ousted CEO uh, resumed control, and with the company sued the bank and obtained a judgment for $18.6 million. Um, and then, so the Farah case then uh, triggered a whole wave of cases in California and Texas with uh, very significant um, uh, victories for, for plaintiffs, um, many of which were upheld at the appellate level. So it's sort of an interesting and recent emergent uh, sort of doctrine in private law. And, the, and so the key elements here are uh, control over the borrower and bad advice. Okay, so those are the sort of two, two parts of this idea of lender liability generally from private law. So now, um, control over the borrower is a really interesting issue in the question, uh, in, in the case of sovereign debt. And I think there, you could have a, a much more extensive discussion and don't have time to go into kind of the specific facts that seem to be successful as allegations. But, um, you know, query, it's a sort of open question um, how much control lenders have over sovereign borrowers. And of course, there's a lot of debate about this. So the anti-globalization activists think that the IMF rules uh, you know, borrower governments, and you know, people who work inside the IMF would say that actually it's a much more contested process, and there are lots of places for resistance. Um, to the international financial institution. So there would be a question of how you could establish control. But the part, um, the second part, uh, bad advice is where I just want to make a, a sort of concluding <laughs> comment about how international trade policy plays in here. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, um, the bad advice in question is the advice to uh, implement trade liberalizing measures on an accelerated basis. Now, trade liberalization is something that most of us would would probably ha at least accept at some level as probably a good idea. And the 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 advice to liberalize um, trade a trade regime uh, when coming from international financial institutions kind of arises out of the idea that borrowers should put their econo macroeconomic um, house in order. Um, so as to ensure sort of sustainable economic growth moving forward and to prevent, you know, recurrent crises. And so that is, that's a sort of longer term argument that uh, you know, would be a separate discussion. But the bad advice in, in, in this particular case is to accelerate trade liberalizing measures in conjunction with a pegged exchange rate policy. So this is kind of the corollary or the complement to, I think, uh, 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 Sherry's reference earlier to the role that a fixed exchange rate can play in exacerbating a borrower's financial situation and obligating that borrower to continue to borrow more money to defend the exchange rate. That that problem is exacerbated when you have very rapid 
trade uh, liberalization, so you have a surge of imports and sudden very strong downward pressure on currency, and that uh, you know really pushes the borrower government back to um, the table to borrow more money. So okay, an example here would be um, Mexico. What's interesting here is that a lot of these borrower governments um, uh, end up liberalizing their, their trade barriers much more quickly than they're actually obligated to do under international trade law. So Mexico negotiated a 15-year phase-out of its agricultural import barriers under NAFTA. But in order to try to stabilize its exchange rate and control inflation, it actually liberalized those barriers in a period of 14 months. And you had a, a huge uh, surge of imports and sudden downward pressure on the peso. And we know what happened uh, in conjunction with the fixed exchange rate. Mexico ultimately couldn't continue to defend that currency and the value of the peso dropped um, you know, within a matter of 50% within a matter of, uh, of a year. Um, so the, the sort of advice to, to rapidly liberalize a trade regime in conjunction with the advice to maintain a fixed exchange rate really put uh, a lot, many borrower governments in a very difficult situation. And the story of why people thought that was a good idea is a whole other story relating to kind of the, emer the, the evolution of economic policy ideologies at that particular moment, the late 1970s and early 1980s. But I would argue that, to bring it back to lender liability doctrine, that there's at least some claim to be made that uh, there was some rashness of judgment in the, um, uh, in the structural adjustment policies that were implemented and that they created situations that, um, that, that generated uh, much of the debt problem uh, that borrowers uh, had, or at least uh, contributed to the prolongation of those, that debt problem. Now, this just goes to the prong of odious debt doctrine around constructive knowledge or liability for lenders, right? It doesn't address the issue of whether the regime is odious. Um, and, you know, whether the facts would be there to support the argument from private law is, uh, you know, unclear and would require further study. But at the very least, I think we have one possible basis for contributing to maybe the more diffuse soft law argument that there should be some sharing of responsibility around debt forgiveness across borrowers and lenders. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Bob, you want to clear it all up for us? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but since this is the third panel, I, I thought I had three points. Um, the first point is, is in addition to um, joining my voice of thanks uh, to Me Too and the students, I just would like to acknowledge, I think, the efforts of Me Too and Lee to take these issues of both odious debt and sovereign debt generally and put on the academic agenda. I mean, I, mean, I think that's the real thing. I mean, it, it's, it, it's nice to be nice to us, but I really think these guys have taken something that the court have done in the past, but have really broadened the focus, the academic focus on it. And for that, I think we all owe them um, a, a great deal of, of thanks. Um, the second point is, um, you know, this is a panel about domestic law analogies. And since my paper has nothing to do with the less domestic law analogies, um, I thought I'd just offer the following observation, and I think it kind of builds on some of the stuff earlier. It's, it's, it's um, you shouldn't look to domestic law for answers because it's a bit unclear what domestic law says. So I think this, the Enron litigation that's going on is a great example now. So right now, Enron is fighting tooth and nail uh, with um, its banks, lenders, and hedge funds over two issues of equitable subordination. Um, issue number one is the issue of paint. If a creditor lends money that's clearly bad, nefarious, you know, meets all the tests for being equitably subordinated, does that taint all the other loans that that creditor has made? So when we think about, you know, the odious creditor point, is it the one loan or is it many loans? Because my guess is a lot of these people are repeat players. There are going to be a number of loans, and to the extent that we have an odious debt issue, one of the issues, is, you know, how tightly do you tie the actual loan to the taint? And that issue is going on today. It's still unresolved. And the second issue that people are fighting tooth and nail in the Southern District about now are what about transfer reliability? So um, I, I think essentially it, it does, private law doesn't answer these answers, but it's interesting that private law is struggling with the very, the very questions that we are struggling with here. Um, unclear who's going to resolve them first or if any. 
Okay, and the third point is my paper, and keeping with the theme of these comments, the paper has three points. Um, the first point, I think, uh, goes back to something we've we kind of been talking about today, and that is really the relationship between sovereign debt restructuring and odious debt is under-theorized. And we really don't know what that relationship is. You can imagine, at least in theory, one of three possible relationships. One is that odious debt is a poor man's sovereign debt restructuring. That, you know, the IMF's attempt to um, get a sovereign debt framework um, has cratered. Um, this is what's left on the table. It's one of the arguments left in our quiver. Um, if we had an optimal uh, sovereign uh, debt restructuring regime, we wouldn't need an odious debt regime. Um, the second view, sort of polar opposite, is that, well, it's totally different. That even if we had optimal sovereign debt restructuring regime, we'd still get rid of some odious debt. debt. Do you get a bounce? This is at least the David Steele's position. I don't know if Patrick signed on to that or yet. I wasn't quite sure where the, the Patrick's in on that as well. Okay. Um, so that, they're, that they're totally separate. And then there's a third situation where you can imagine some sort of interface between the two. Most discussions about restructuring sovereign debt focus on notions of sustainability, uh, which is a very big term, which is a big thing. You threw a lot of junk you don't want to look at. And one of the things that might be part of the discussion of what is a sustainable debt is the nature of the debt we're getting rid of. So it may be that in tweaking uh, what counts as sustainable debt for a sovereign, should we ever have a sovereign debt restructuring regime, one of the factors toward what is a sustainable debt is how was that debt incurred. So that's the three possible relationships. We haven't really figured out which one we're talking about, uh, except David and Patrick have. Uh, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty otherwise. Um, the second point in the paper is that both in the sovereign debt restructuring literature generally, and in this literature in particular, they share the same instinct. And the instinct seems to be, gosh, we want to move from politics to law. That we look out there as lawyers, and we see a lot of things that are ad hoc, done by political influence. And what we want to do is make them more legal, more predictable. Um, I don't know if this is our train as lawyers. Um, certainly, uh, for those of us who come from the dark side of bankruptcy, it, it comports a lot of our intuitions, how we don't like governments picking winners or losers. We want clear regimes that everyone's entitled um, to operate under. But this instinct seems to be motivating both literatures. Um, and the third point is some skepticism about that instinct. Um, I think Dan started off uh, with some skepticism about it. Is it right as a practical matter, right? in the sense of how far can we really get rid of politics here, uh, but also as a normative matter. It, it's unclear to me that the optimal way to address these problems is in a, in, a, um, in a situation that's devoid of political considerations. You know, sort of one sort of off the top of the head idea is something like you may want a mixed system, a system that provides very minimal basic debt relief, uh, to things that we can all agree on, the non-contentious things, and that the more ambitious forms of debt relief are left to political mechanisms, though it has what for some lawyers is the un, um, palatable result that some countries can get more debt relief than others, right? Iraq gets more debt relief than does Sudan, right? But nevertheless, it may be that um, given the mix of politics and law here, that would maximize the debt relief by having actually both a politically um, acceptable, minimal sort of quote unquote legal system coupled with an add-on of debt relief that's politically driven. So that's the point. Thank, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, just one comment and then I'll invite the panel to uh, comment on each other, other's presentations. If you want to take a more Olympian view of what's gone on today, uh, the theme of this panel is to what degree can one use domestic uh, private law uh, principles and procedures to deal with an odious debt problem, however you want to define the odious debt problem. It contrasts with what was the theme of the morning's panel, which is uh, ought we to try to look at this in a more global way and say, well, if we can identify an odious debt, uh, then fine, all, all the debts falling into that category can be repudiated both at a legal level and at a political level with impunity. Or second, uh, can we identify an odious regime and then presume that the odious regime will act always odiously uh, 
uh, and therefore once we identify the odious regime, we've solved the problem. If private law, domestic law concepts can be brought to bear, they're far more targeted you see, you don't have the problem, for example, of saying, suppose the odious regime borrows to build the children's hospital and steals none of the money. Uh, uh, that, under the more broad brush approach, would wind up getting, that baby would get swept out with the dirty bathwater. Whereas in a private law context, the, it would be case and controversy. So the loan agreement, the debt instrument, is brought before a domestic judge. Uh, and uh, there is a claim to enforce it, and at that point the borrower can turn to whatever armory of doctrines or law uh, he thinks will uh, allow him to avoid that enforcement, whether it, is, it be agency, piercing the corporate veil, equitable subordination, or, or anything else. So th in the broadest context, that's, uh, I, I think, the difference you're seeing between these two panels. Essentially, we're testing the limits of the different remedies uh, now, assuming we could all agree on the problem, and I'm not sure we could all agree on the problem, but assuming there is a problem, uh, we're talking about remedies. I'll leave it open to the panel if you would like to comment on each other's. Yes, Paul. I, I wanted to book in one comment that Deborah made about agency, and I should say at the beginning that there's some danger in doing that, having spent 10 years as an advisor to the restatement of agency uh, for which Deborah was the reporter. Those of you, if you know how the ALI works, there's a, there's a group of advisors that are this balanced group, and every year that group meets with the reporter to discuss the draft. And what I learned by sitting through 10 years of those meetings is that uh, Deborah knew more agency law than the rest of us put together. Uh, but having made that disclaimer, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me try one, one small okay, one point. More, one yeah, more <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deborah said that it talked about the risk. She identified the ri as, a, as a goal of agency law to uh, deal with the risk of opportunistic behavior by the principal to the detriment of the third party. What I would assert to you from trying to get you to envision that triangle that I started with is that there is a parallel risk, also a concern of agency law, which is the risk of opportunistic behavior by the agent to the detriment or, and the third party to the detriment of the principal. And agency law worries about that as well. I would assert further that, that Pierce and the Veil talks about a different risk in the same triangular picture the risk of the opportunistic behavior by the agent and the principal together, by the shareholder officer and the corporation together, to the, to the detriment of the third party. Uh, law has, private law, has always been concerned about allocating, uh, refereeing uh, abuse of those risks. And, and to build on the point Lee made at the very beginning, the courts of New York and the courts of England where most of the private law in this area occurs, have always been very comfortable in applying principles of piercing the veil, in resetting the risk of, of non-performance. Of non and, 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 and participants in those courts have always been comfortable with courts doing that. And so what we're asking with odious debt is to say, look, it's a similar kind of risk. It's a risk of, of by that triangle, it's a risk of the agent and the third party together taking advantage of the principal, and the same way that the courts of New York and London uh, reset that risk in agency and in Pearson the Veil, they can also reset that risk in odious debt. Thank you, yeah, no, I, One thing I'm curious about in, in all these arguments is you know, who are we making them to? You know, um, when I make them to a court, you know, it's common law development and I know what it happens. Um, you know, I was taken, a, I was a bit surprised uh, by Lee's comment at lunch that the Paris Club members were as much worried about precedent and odious debt than a court would. I mean, you know, so to the extent that we don't have a court to make them to, you know, to what extent do members in this informal community worry about things like the force of arguments, the force of debt relief, you know, the, the force of a lender liability argument, or equitable subordination argument? Are they, are they, do they recognize in the discussions a sort of a generation of, let's say, norms as opposed to law? Uh, th the answer is yes, they are intensely worried about it. The Paris Club is the group of uh, the developed countries who uh, have since 1956 uh, renegotiated uh, jointly uh, debts of uh, other governments, borrowing governments that have gotten into trouble. They do this under the auspices of the French Treasury. 
uh, and it has been nicknamed the Paris Club. But are they concerned about precedent? They are obsessed with it because you it's see- It's not just the actions, the reasons, the, it, the yes, rationale. Yes, the rationale, uh, because they know that every year a certain number of countries will come to them. Uh, every country has a story. Hmm? We are a poor country. Uh, we are an abused country, whatever it is. In the naked city. In the naked city. It, if they begin, this is what they'll say, if they begin to customize their remedies because your story has tugged upon their heartstrings uh, more uh, violently than others, they know that they're lost, that they will sink down. And so they have has historically developed various remedies. So you, you get Toronto terms. Tell me your per capita GDP. It's a little bit like Johnny Carson and Karnak. You remember when he used to take the seal letter and then he'd give the answer and then he'd open the letter? Well, it, 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 it is the... So they, they want clear rules in what... Absolutely. And we're all talking about is vague standards. Well, with respect, I'm not sure. I, it, it seems to me if one could get this in front of domestic judges in the same way that, that we all as lawyers uh, have some sense of what the law is, the judge has some sense too. Let, let, let me take advantage of my moderator role because Adam has, I think, raised this fascinating question of equitable subordination, and this is something that I will scold me too for not having thought of. Um, <laughs> thinking as a, as a practicing lawyer, uh, the, when I read your paper, the first thought I had was, uh, it's a brilliant idea, but how does one actually articulate it? So I'm the Republic of Ruritania. I've been sued in a New York court by Bank, uh, bank X. And I want to say about Bank X, Your Honor, uh, Bank X should be subordinated to some other folks. And the judge is going to say to me, where are the other folks, counselor? And I'm going to say, well, they're not here. So it's a little bit like three billy goats gruff, you know, don't eat me. The next guy coming across the bridge is larger. When we were young and, and reckless, Me Too and I once proposed something as a, as a kind of an alternative to sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, uh, which was to say, well, wait, no, wait a minute. We've got federal courts and we've got class actions. Uh, isn't it fair to say that all the creditors to the same debtor are to some degree in the same boat? Uh, and would it not be fair to say, let's all get in there? This, this replicates a bankruptcy court, of course. The, the intention was without a transnational bankruptcy court, could you do more or less the same thing domestically? Um, well, what's wrong with this idea, Adam? Suppose I'm the Republic of Ruritania and I'm in trouble. It's absolutely clear I'm in trouble. I've got all of, I've got 20 different creditors out there. What's wrong with saying, I'm going to invite you all into a courtroom in New York. I'm going to say just as a class action uh, a, a defendant would say, look, I've got a limited group of, of resources here. I've got differing uh, claimants to it, and I need the court's instruction as to how I'm supposed to go about this. And oh, by the way, once we all get in the courtroom, then I'm going to start to tell you that, that Debbie's loan ought to be equitably subordinated to Bob's, et cetera, et cetera, and let them quarrel among themselves. What's wrong with that, Adam? I don't see necessarily that anything's wrong with that. I mean, it does, just as a first uh, kind of stab at that, it, it does bring both of the questions of, you know, the debt overhang and odious debt together in the courtroom. Um, and, uh, and I don't know anything about the procedural questions that it would raise. But, I mean, assuming that you could get everyone to the table, um, uh, then that would be an excellent, at least from my perspective, kind of seeing the world through my paper now, um, an excellent context in which to claim that some claims should be subordinated you, you uh, get, to others. Do you get discharge on the back? I mean, subordination bites only with discharge. It ha yeah, I mean, that, Otherwise, you know, I'm that's why I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll just yes. around forever. That, well, absolutely, yeah. That's Melissa's point, that it's not really subordination, and I, I kind of admit that. Um, uh, although the doctrine itself, uh, both as a practical matter and sometimes actually explicitly allows for discharge or avoidance. Debbie? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment that um, picks up a little bit on Bob Thompson's <laughs> suggestion, which is not, the agency points of which are not, of course, incompatible with, with what I believe to be the law of agency. And it goes to a point that Melissa made, uh, which is that, well, it's really two points, I mean, which is that the line between complicity and complacency is a 
is a very intriguing one, okay? And to what extent we shift what we view as acceptable complacency into borderline complicity, I think is an interesting proposition also. But going to Bob Thompson's point, these, of course, are questions with which um, the common law of agency and the law of fiduciary duty more generally is familiar. Uh, there's a rich body of doctrine on uh, the consequences for a third party who has aided and abetted uh, an agent or a trustee's uh, breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, a bit of a question in thinking about those doctrines in this context is, of course, the remedy, okay? I mean, the, the, a, a conventional remedy, for example, that you, one might think about would be um, rescinding, right? The principal would rescind, uh, have the right to rescind, the right of rescission, or right to rescind uh, the transaction with the excessively complicit third party. But that, of course, in this <laughs> private law tradition comes with a, a condition or a requisite of restitution. Right, so the, princi the principal could rescind <laughs> the obligation, but the principal would have to, as it were, give back the money. So uh, now it, you know, it turns out that those doctrines within um, restitution and unjust enrichment are complex also. So if it's not feasible uh, to give it back, that's a factor. Uh, perhaps this turns on the extent to which the third party would be unjustly enriched or not, you know, regarding the, the um, extent of the restitution. Uh, but, I mean, this, the, 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 the body of a pretty well-developed law about fiduciary duty more generally uh, and remedial consequences upon breach is, of course, also, I think, something one would want to think about in this setting. Thank you. Uh, yes, Melissa. So I guess this comes back around to, um, I think, Chantal reacting a little bit to us talking about the, the level of control that creditors may have and what that means. It seems it's an empirical question how much control creditors are exercising over sovereigns through their debt arrangements, just <coughs> like we have that question in the domestic context, which um, Bob has written about and others, and it's, it's really intriguing, but I don't think we have the full picture all the way fleshed out. And my sense was that the concern that equitable subordination and other doctrines would fill is to encourage creditors to be more active um, in policing rather than less, which really flips the problem domestically on its head. Now, I don't know that that's, as I started with, that this is an empirical question, that I don't know if, that, if that's yeah. true. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up to the audience in one second, but Chantal, the, the, I had the same question. If, if someone had attended only the morning part of this, this uh, uh, conference, they might have left saying, well, the real problem here is that these lenders are not exercising enough control over their borrowers. They're giving them money. They're allowing some of it to be stolen. They're allowing it to be used for ill-conceived projects. And what really is needed here is a ramping up of both diligence on the part of the lender as well as post-disbursement monitoring. Uh, mm -hmm. Conditionality, if you want to use the word of the IFIs, but post-disbursement monitoring is how a private creditor would see it. Now one comes into the afternoon session, <laughs> and one, if only attended the afternoon session, you say, well, the real problem here is that any lender uh, reckless enough to begin to impose that kind of conditions, much less prescriptions for how the money should be used and so forth, exposes themselves possibly to lender liability down the road when the borrower comes back and says, uh, look, uh, you were, what was your word, meddling in my affairs, and... Uh, that was your word. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, someone's <laughs> word, meddling. So, I mean, it, 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 it seems to me it's a, it's a right. fair question. Well, and I, I think that it points to also the history of the sort of political economy of sovereign uh, lender relationships in that there's really a dividing line between you know pre-debt crisis and post-debt crisis. Pre-debt crisis, everybody says sovereigns can't go bankrupt, and it's you know, um, you know this sort of moment of relative political influence of the third world, and you know there's just there's a sort of hands-off lending approach, and you know an excess of petrodollars, and this whole you know sort of confluence of factors, and there's probably too little control. Um, and so it, you know, and so I think that's where you get the question of complicity with bad practices of odious regimes. And then 
post debt crisis, you have you know arguably a flip where the financial institutions and the lenders kind of freak out and they begin to exercise, you know, what some would argue would be too much control or at least uh, control uh, coupled with bad advice, right? That that sort of exacerbates the problem. Um, so, you know, I think it does become a complicated question. But I would say again, though, that that the the thing the the piece of the puzzle I was talking about was not how to address an odious regime. In other words, my example was Mexico, and I think the lender liability doctrine potentially uh, aids odious uh, debt um, argumentation, but it would also be sort of independent from that. Um, I, I guess one question I have is whether in equitable subordination would encourage uh, lenders to exercise more control or less control. You learn to be coy. <laughs> right. That's what right. they do domestically, right? So, right. so the, what the banks do is they don't say, you know, you'll put in a CRO. They say, I can't wait for a waiver. If you had a CRO, I might be able to find some time in my schedule. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, right. I mean the, yeah. Uh, people are worried about seeing too much control, but they, they find ways to finesse the issue. Yeah. Let, let me open it up to our colleagues in the audience. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. I, I've been reflecting on the use of private law to justify claims against former creditors who've been paid. Uh, and one thought uh, that occurred to me, uh, inspired by Deborah's comments, was unjust enrichment. If they made a whole lot of interest profit off a transaction that was uh, odious transaction, maybe you could require them to disgorge whatever profit they made out of the transaction. Uh, and the other is, does the doctrine of, uh, of uh, preference have something to do with this? Uh, can you choose which creditor you pay? In the law of bankruptcy, as I recall, you can't do that. If you're insolvent, you can't prefer one creditor over another. Uh, does that principle have any application to uh, these international transactions? I can answer it if you like. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but they should. Uh, well, that's a different issue. Uh, the, the raging issue in this line of work for the last few years has been whether a clause that appears in virtually every cross-border debt, private debt instrument called a pari passu clause, a clause that says this debt shall rank equally pari passu with your other external indebtedness, whether that clause carries with it the baggage of saying you may not pay preferentially one creditor over another. If you have insufficient funds to pay everyone, you must pay everyone rateably. Uh, the weight of authoritative opinion is that it does not mean that, uh, uh, and that sovereigns have always, uh, since time immemorial, had the practice of paying certain creditors when others weren't paid. Classic example. All of the international financial institutions, IMF, World Bank, et cetera, all insist on being paid in the middle of a crisis, even though the private creditors are being restructured, the trade creditors are being restructured, and the bilateral creditors are being restructured. In other words, they're, they're, the, the good news, if you will, that there is no transnational bankruptcy regime in place is that the law of preferences and fraudulent conveyances does not apply. Yeah, and just to respond, um, uh, the doctrine of, doctrine of equitable subordination, for example, envisions something like disgorgement in the use of constructive trust. For, for example, if something's been paid, it can be determined that that's held in constructive trust for, uh, for another creditor. And I, it, my own take is I'm not as uncomfortable with the idea of disgorgement as, uh, as other people are, at least in terms of intercreditor claims. Questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> First, I would like to correct an error. When I talked about the government incurring debt, I did not use odious debts, but I spoke about the legitimate debts, which overlap to some extent. And within that, I concentrated on what I called illegal debts. Now, it is very well possible that you see a government both, ha both has incurred debts, or de facto incurred debt, where on the ones were properly signed by those guys having the authority, but the others ascribed to the government were just signed by someone. So you would have both at the same time. And in that case, of course, that clearly applies what I have said. Uh, there was one question coming back to what the chair has admonished us, the uh, private domestic law analogies. I was very surprised to hear from no one one very fundamental principle of any domestic law, that if you have 
a grievance with your creditors, your creditor cannot be your judge. Internationally, it is so. The Paris Club, they are creditors. They decide on their own debtor. They are IFIs, they are creditors. They decide on the developing countries. I mean, if someone calls this as law or justice, as they ask Pony and Equi, I think then it's a total misperception of these words. And I think here the very fundamental uh, basis of any proper, decent legal system just is blown away. That, Imagine yourself really, coming into a want, court. Want to go from politics to law. I mean, it yeah. is politics now. People want it. Yeah. No, it's well, not a question of politics. Just imagine someone coming into a court of law and all the judges sitting there, the creditors. But it's also markets as well as politics, and, and markets have always been alongside law, and, and we have two ways of resolving things. We can have self-help through negotiation, through private interests, or we can have law. I think yeah. this, we can have both. I think <laughs> we do have a, lot, a fair amount of self-help renegotiation in a closed room. <laughs> In, in re renegotiating those, or, or rewriting those terms. I don't know it is, because here you always have a law. You're doing it in the shadow of the law. And that is very much different. Hmm. Because there's legal relief available if you can't get the conclusion. Well, that's yep. true for most of international law. There aren't many circumstances in which governments actually have access to a neutral third decision maker. There are few, but usually it's the government's decide. They're legislators more than they are well, in international, in international in law, you have the arbitration. It's established. You could do it. Yep. Government to government. Well, uh, you know. Just to answer this, but actually to get to a, a, a more fundamental question I wanted to ask. Um, you know, most loan agreements, in my experience, have choice of law and choice of forum clauses. So this is something, you, you can argue that it's inequitable, that their, their hand has been forced and they've, they've got to choose the courts of the country of the lender. But nonetheless, they made a choice at the time that they signed the loan agreement to accept that forum and those and, and that law as binding. I mean, it, it goes to the question, though, that, that I wanted to ask uh, more basically. Your assumption at the beginning, sort of short circuit the thing that is the segue from this morning to this afternoon, is that since 90% of these loan agreements are subject to either English law or the law of the state of New York, um, that gets around the question of when we jump from the international fora to state domestic fora, uh, then the question is, what's that law going to deliver that wasn't there in international law? And the suggestion, at least of this first panel, is that because there are these well-developed private law remedies that exist as a matter of domestic law, at least in sophisticated commercial jurisdictions like New York State and, and England, uh, that that's going to you know, give us what we don't have uh, in international law. But it seems like that isn't a complete answer to the question because, for example, if you get a judgment in a New York State court, uh, or in a federal court sitting in New York, which is more likely, um, you got to take it somewhere and get it enforced. The mm -hmm. thing you brought up at lunch today, you know, mm -hmm. okay, you've got the judgment, now what? Uh, and it doesn't seem to me that you necessarily get ahead of the game just by using the available law that's much more developed in the domestic forum. You've still got a transnational problem that's almost insoluble. Let, let, me, let me offer you something that I think has been in the shadow of the, of the, of the entire day. If you listen just to this discussion, you might say, God, <coughs> there are two choices. Hmm? Uh, all of these very bright folks are saying they're looking for a defense, uh, a justification, moral, uh, ethical, political, legal, uh, that avoids countries having to repay uh, certain types of indebtedness when they become over indebted and, and so forth. So, so that you might be left with the impression that you either find the, uh, the, 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 the holy grail of that or the alternative is the debtor has to repay everything uh, and th th those are the binary choices. That is not the reality, friends. Uh, without, without deflating the entire theme of the day, uh, the reality is this. Countries get in trouble all the time. Some good ones, some bad ones. Uh, when they do, there's a process for them to renegotiate their debt, very often to write it down, stretch it out, and get debt relief. It is a process that is messy, it is time-consuming, it is exasperating. I yield to no one in my sense of exasperation with the process, but over the last 25 years, many billions of dollars have been written down and stretched out through that process. 
and that what we're really talking about is people who will not participate in that and become litigious and so forth, but come on, is that really uh, a, a such a large problem that we should be talking about constructing doctrines whose effect, once launched upon the world, are uncertain in terms of what it will do to chill lending. In other words, we, we have a very messy, non-bankruptcy, maybe non-legal structure in place that deals with these problems. Ought we to <coughs> try to make uh, 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 the thing perfect, perhaps at the risk of making it unworkable? There, there's, there's a realist's view of the matter. I'll give one more comment. I'm, I'm running over. Yes, sir. Uh, picking up on the point uh, you just made, uh, you raised the question uh, about the effect of on lending. But may I suggest that once one raises questions about the capacity of a particular government to act as an agent for the state uh, which it governs, I don't understand how one could be confident that the question could be limited to the issue of debt. That is to say, if a particular government, for some reason, ought not be treated as an agent of the state for debt purposes, why should it be treated as an agent of the state when it enters into a treaty? Uh, as a practical matter, of course, this would only give a successor government uh, an excuse to uh, try to get out of the treaty, but when one thinks about all the various sorts of interactions that governments have, uh, to say that a particular group of people can't be their agent, it seems to me, raises particular questions. A corollary to this, to the extent you're talking in, about domestic courts, is would an American domestic court, either state or federal, have the authority to say that a government which has been recognized by the United States is in some sense not the government of the state, that is not properly treated as an agent. I, I don't know. I know that normally the uh, recognition by the, by the United States by the President is binding. But I, oh, we'd love to respond to that. Maybe we will. Can we ask you to take a quick coffee and come back in 10 minutes at 2.45? Please. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, Thank you very much. You. Actually, I'm going to ask if everyone could come back in five minutes. We'd five like minutes. to begin promptly at 2.40. Thanks. Really? Moving this along? Yeah, they are. Good for them. <laughs>